Hello guys! For this video, I'm going to cover how you should do research and citations for this class. We'll also talk about your research paper. Let me talk about my expectations far as your research paper goes. One thing I expect is your sources should have named authors. By named authors, I want to know specifically who wrote that article. Do not choose articles where the author is not known. You want to know who specifically wrote it. So for example, one thing that wouldn't work is say the author is editor of Van Gogh's website. That's not a name. No one is named editor Van Gogh's website. I want a human name like John Doe or April Goki, something like that. And the reason this is important is there, there's two issues that are coming that could pop up when you do research. One is you might be reading research from someone who is biased. You won't know that per se, unless you can easily research who wrote the article. Another problem that you can encounter is if you don't have a named person attached to a source, this could be a random person who has no idea what they're talking about or has no credentials. Ideally, if you're reading research or articles or papers, you want to at least know if this person has some background in what they're talking about. There, they shouldn't be a random unnamed person. Another expectation I have is you should have plenty of in-text citations. Don't be afraid to do that often. So an in-text citation is a, usually a couple of words that you put at the end of the sentence in brackets. Usually it's the author's last name. If it's coming from a book, it's the author's last name and a page number. You do this to prevent you from being flagged for plagiarism. An in-text citation is a clear indicator that this particular sentence and information is not your own. It's coming from someone else. That's why you do it. You must also have a works cited page. That is a separate page where you put all the information about your resources in. So if I wanted to look up one of your resources to see what's actually in it, I go to your works cited page. The last major requirement is there should be no quotes. You should paraphrase all the information you are using. You should take any information you're taking from some other source and put it in your own words. If you send me a paper and there's no in-text citations, there, there's a lot of quotes, those are those will lead to a very poor paper grade. Far as the named author thing, one of the first things I recommend is if you're doing research and you're looking at articles, that should be the first thing you look at is, is there someone's name attached to this article? If not, just move on. That will save you so much time. You don't want to be reading an article and find out you can't use it because there's no named author there. Another thing I expect is you should not be using encyclopedias for your paper. When you get into college, using encyclopedias is frowned upon. So you shouldn't be using Wikipedia or citing Britannica. That said, it is okay to start there. If you wanted a little background information, you can read a Wikipedia article. It's also helpful sometimes to look at the sources listed underneath. Wikipedia usually does this, so if you look at something in Wikipedia, you'll find multiple sources underneath it, and you can go to those sources. If those sources have a name attached to them, then you can use those in your paper, but not the Wikipedia article. The last big requirement for our sources is don't use stuff aimed at children. So for example, I've had a few students in the past use stuff from National Geographic Kids. You're not a kid. You are an adult. You are soon will be an adult. You should not be using materials geared towards junior high students. So make sure you're using materials geared towards college level students or above. Now, when it comes to doing your research, this technique is very important to follow, especially when you do more advanced papers. Our paper for this class is not super advanced, but in the future, you might be writing a paper that's 10 plus pages long and having to quote or cite a lot of sources. One thing you should be doing as you're doing research is collecting the information in its own Word document. So if you find something, part of an article that you think you might cite in your paper, copy and paste it into a separate document. 
you should save the sources website and put some basic information. You should put the title of the article there and the author. author. That way everything is nicely organized and it makes it easier to sort through your information. So it's good to collect a whole bunch of information that you kind of find interesting and then after you've done that, you can sift through it and find nice stuff to add to your paper. Now, one thing I don't mind students using as a tool is ChatGPT, but remember, you should not use ChatGPT to write your paper. That said, it can be helpful if you are in a rut as far as coming up with a paper topic. That's not going to be an issue for your research paper. I already gave you a topic. But in the future, you might have more free game as far as what you can write about. So you can go to ChatGPT and ask it for potential topics on a subject. The downside is those won't be unique topics. Another thing is it can be a good place to go for a quick summary of something before you do your research. So it's kind of like an alternative to the encyclopedia. So if you prefer ChatGPT, you can go there to get a general summary of something versus trying to find an article in an encyclopedia. The other thing is it can be good to, for editing papers. We talked about this in the past. I mentioned this online. But there are some downsides. The biggest downside is your paper may be flagged for AI usage. So if you ever submit a paper where you use a website to edit it, to get out the mistakes, you always want to save your rough drafts. Honestly, if you can avoid using ChatGPT to edit your papers, that's the best scenario, especially in the long term. One thing that does happen is sometimes there's been stories of people using ChatGPT to write their cover letters for their jobs. And there have been a significant number of people that lost their job or, or were not accepted or hired for that position because their cover letter was flagged for ChatGPT usage. That can happen even if you did write your cover letter but you use an AI to fix it. Sometimes you get those false flags. So it's best if you can avoid it to not use it. But if you do end up using it, I personally don't mind, but always turn in your rough draft, the draft that hasn't been fixed by a website or AI, and then turn in your final draft. The cons with ChatGBT is unfortunately, you cannot use it to find sources. The database for ChatGPT is a bit out of date. So if, if you were to use it and it were to give you some sources, all the links would be broken. Another issue is if you're using ChatGPT to get some general information, one of the other big downsides is you don't know who is the source. So ChatGPT will regurgitate a lot of stuff from the internet and you don't know exactly where that is coming from. You know, it's kind of the same issue of not having a named author as far as ChatGPT goes. Now let's take some time talking about how to do in-text citations. I have an example of an in-text citation coming from a book. If you have the textbook, feel free to use that as one of your sources, that's totally fine. Below I have a sentence that I have paraphrased. So remember, whenever you're using stuff for an article or a book, you need to put in your own words. At the end of that sentence, you'll put in brackets the author's last name and the page number. There's no commas. Feel free to do that as much as you want. If, if it's any information that's not yours, feel free to put a citation there. And honestly, it'll help you with word count too. So it's kind of a win-win. It protects you from plagiarism and it helps you a tiny bit with word count. Now, if you are citing an article, then you just need to do the last name. So when if you're doing articles online, remember, you want to see if it first has an author. So when I was looking up this artist, Berth Morsot, The Cradle, I before I read this article, I made sure that there was an author. And I saw this was written by Norma Smith. So if I'm citing something from this article, I just put the author's last name. So if it's not a book, or a journal. So sometimes you'll find journals online that are digital versions of something that was copied or printed out. 
you would still use a page number. So if it's a journal and there's page numbers in it, even if it's say online, you should put the page number there. But if it's just a regular article, like we see here, it's just the last name. Now, sometimes you might have a source that has more than one author. If there's two authors, you put both last names in the in-text citations and you add and in between them. So if the author is Jones and Yoder, that's what you throw at the end of the sentence. If there's more, if there's three or more authors, you do something a little bit different. So this source, DeWitt et al, 223, so this is a book, a textbook that is used for art appreciation. DeWitt is one of the authors. Et al lets the person know that there's more. So this book is written by three or more authors. So anytime that happens, you put the most prominent last name that's on the book, and then you put et al page number. Or if there, if this is an article, then you just do DeWitt et al. You don't have to put in the page number. Now, if there's for some reason in the future, you're using a source and there is no named author, what you do in that scenario is you put the t a few words from the title of that article, that online article, in quotation marks and then put brackets around it. You don't want to put the whole title. Like you don't want to do an in-text citation with 10 words in it. You just do two or three. But ideally, you should not be doing this. Far as your works cited page, this is your this is its own page in your paper. You want to make sure that your sources are also double spaced. So sometimes when students do this page, they have the source and a single space for the source. If it goes over more than one line, you should double space it. So even your works cited page should be double spaced. It should also be indented on the second line. So say you have a source for a website and it goes beyond one line, each line after that needs to be double spaced and indented by the tab key. So keep that in mind. The, it shouldn't be all lined up to the left. There should be an indent on the second, third, fourth line, depending on how giant your citation is. The other thing I'll quickly mention is feel free to use a website to help you with your sources. I sometimes like to use citationmachine.net, but there's others out there. Just use the one that you prefer. The thing you have to remember though, is these are not always accurate. So you need to double check to make sure that it's getting all the information or it's doing the right source. Also make sure that you choose MLA format. A lot of times students will use these websites, but they will leave it on APA format. So that's not the format you're using for this class. We want to make sure you select MLA. Now let's talk a bit about paraphrasing. Now why is quoting frowned upon? It's viewed as lazy writing in academia. It, it's something that a computer could do. You want to be more than a computer. You want to bring in that unique human element into it. So if you quote that's viewed as too simple, you want to reward it in a way that if you were to take that information and speak it, it would be in your own voice. Now, one exception to no quotations is you can do a quote if it's being taken from a historical figure. So for example, here to the right, we have a work by Leonardo da Vinci. We do have some quotes for him. One thing he did talk about, and we have his words from, is his technique called sufmato. So Sufmato, he describes this technique as without lines or borders in a manner of smoke. So that's okay. If you're actually quoting, say, the artist or a really famous historical figure, that's acceptable. But if it's not that case, if it's just general information in an article, you should not be doing quotes. Now, when you paraphrase, I mentioned you should do something in your own voice. Another thing you might consider when you paraphrase information is to compress the information. A lot of times when you read journals, especially academic journals, they can be very wordy and over the top. Ideally, you want to write it out in a more simplistic manner, in a more digestible manner, and make it easier to understand what this person is saying. So here I have an example of a bunch of information from this article by Wilfred Niels Arnold. 
my goal in my paraphrasing is to take the most important parts of this paragraph and smush it, compress it. It's something that's easier to go through. Like this is a really wordy paragraph. So this is my example. So this is coming from a journal by, by Arnold. It's on page 22 in the journal. So even though I found this online because it's a journal, it was originally printed, I do have to put in a page number. I compress that into two sentences. So that's another big goal of paraphrasing is if you can take information and make it easier to digest and compress and easier for the reader to absorb, that's very ideal. Another thing is when you paraphrase, you want to heavily reword and restructure the sentences. You don't want to just change a few words. So for example, I have this sentence here coming from the same article. The extent of Vincent's drinking, so we're talking about Vincent Van Gogh, is difficult to define. But we do know that he admitted to excesses. Poor paraphrasing is you're just choosing, changing a few words. So in the poor example, extent's been changed to scope. Uh, difficult has been changed to hard, define, determine. So only a few words have been changed, and most of this sentence has remained. Now, if you have paraphrasing this poorly done, you are going to get flagged for plagiarism. Your teacher may ask you to rewrite those portions of your paper. Or if they're not very friendly, they'll just give you a poor grade. <laughs> so you want to make sure you take the time to really re reword things. So an example of good paraphrasing. I have Van Gogh enjoyed drinking, which he confessed to be a lot at times. That said, we are unsure of how severe his alcoholic consumption was. Sometimes to make information a little bit easier or to turn it into a way that you would speak it, your sentence might end up being longer, which is great for word count, but sometimes it might end up being shorter. It just depends on your goals. So that's all I have for our lesson. If you have any questions about our research paper, feel free to reach out to me. If you're struggling with sources, once again, feel free to reach out to me. I can always help with that. If you want me to double check something or as what you're choosing or the artwork that you've selected. If you're unsure, reach out to me, send me a message. I'll get back to you right away.